Josh Pornell, who's phillymag.com, birds 24-7, and Josh covers the Eagles on a regular basis. He's our guest now here on the Sports Bash. Uh, hello, Josh. How are you, pal? Good, guys. How are you doing today? Doing okay. I'm trying to get my voice back a little better from last week when I was just barking out the commands. Uh, not very well at times, but uh, speaking of guys that bark out the commands, uh, the Eagles fans and the Eagles are trying to pin down who exactly they're going to see at quarterback. What did you learn about that today? Uh, well, you mean in terms of the, the Cowboys starters this week? Yes. It's going to yeah, it's going to be Dak Prescott is, is going to be the starter for the Cowboys. And then I would expect maybe around halftime, I would expect Dak Prescott to play about a half, and then Mark Sanchez will come in and finish out the game. I know Eagles fans have just been longing to see more Mark Sanchez, so you'll be able to get your fix on Sunday. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that was on their uh, wish list to Santa or not, but uh, so no Tony Romo in any scenario is what you're uh, thinking. No, I mean, I'm not even sure if he'll be active. I mean, that's one thing that would be interesting to see is do they even activate him because you know you, you start Dak Prescott you're going to put in Mark Sanchez you know somewhere on the middle of the game um, and then obviously something happens to Sanchez the decision then becomes well do we want to put our starter back out there and risk injury to him or do we want to put Tony Romo who you know we're trying to trade and get as much value as we can in the offseason who has obviously be, been injury prone so that will be kind of the biggest question will be is Tony Romo even active uh, but it's very unlikely that we'll see him on Sunday. Well, we'll shy away from the uh, Cowboys QB position for a minute and talk about the Eagles signal caller, who uh, I've seen a lot of talk this week about, A, just the fact that we're going into the final week of the regular season, and he's still there. He's still the guy. He hasn't missed a significant time. I mean, there was a guy who you weren't sure was going to play uh, when the preseason was going on. He had an injury in the preseason, but Carson Wentz has not only been durable, but you have a nice article on uh, phillymag.com about his pocket presence and what Frank Reich had to say. Uh, what's some of the latest news about Carson Wentz in that regard? Yeah, well, I mean, one thing that's kind of been the, the big mantra this week around the Novacare complex is just about how Carson Wentz is playing his best football of the year right now. And obviously, if you look at the box score, even if you look at some of the game film, uh, you may you know be hesitant or, or wondering why they would say that, but there's just so many things outside of what you see on the field. He's just so much more comfortable. It's small things like knowing how to allocate his time, you know, knowing, you know, okay, at 7 o'clock on a Monday I should be doing this. And so he's just much more comfortable. Um, he's really grown as a leader. And just, you know, on the field in terms of his pocket presence, being able to use his legs a little bit more because obviously that was a big thing early on in the season was you have this great athlete at quarterback, but you kind of have to walk a fine line between maximizing what you can get out of his legs while also preserving him for the long haul because this is the, the guy that you hope is your quarterback for the next decade. And so early on, you know, it was a lot, there was a lot of talk about, well, he has to slide more or, you know, get out of bounds and avoid the big hits. And so he's grown not just in that regard, but also, okay, these are the situations where I can use my legs more and then, you know, try to attack downfield. And if I can make a guy miss, you know, in the pocket or maybe outside the pocket, I'm going to do that and then try to make a play. And so it's really been him learning how to balance, you know, extending the plays with his legs. And even against the Giants, we saw it several times. Obviously, one time it resulted in an interception, but that's one thing that you really like is, just kind of the natural feel that, that he has in the pocket and how he's improved his sense of when do I extend the play and when do I just get rid of the ball. Josh, um, as you look at this game, obviously, you know, fans are starting to focus in on the future and, and the draft spot that they may have from the Vikings. Um, do you win or lose this game? You know, that kind of thing. But you've been around the players. You've been around the building. They've played with a lot more energy, it seems, uh, the last couple of weeks. Uh, what's the feeling like heading into this one? It is the Cowboys. It is a game, you know, a division opponent, uh, a chance to not be swept by them. What's the team and the players been like? What's the mood been like with them as they get ready for this one? Oh, yeah, I mean, they've they've absolutely been uh, motivated the past few weeks, and obviously for this game as well. And Jordan Hicks was talking about how he hopes they see Dak Prescott for the whole game. They want to go up against the starters because they want to go up against Dallas's best and beat them. That's that's what their focus is. I mean, that first matchup this year where the Eagles blew that 10-point fourth-quarter lead and lost in overtime, uh, several Eagles talked this week about how that was kind of the turning point of their season, and that really is what changed things for them. And so I think obviously a little bit of the revenge factor, but also just ending the season on a strong note because 
you know, unless you're a guy like a Malcolm Jenkins or a Zach Ertz, you know, someone who recently signed a big deal, long-term deal, and you know you're going to be here next year no matter what, you know, almost all of these guys are playing for jobs next season, and, and that's motivation enough is to put out that good game film. And, you know, these guys are obviously either hoping to be back in Philadelphia or put out enough game film so they can get a job elsewhere. So a lot of it's just as much as, let me extend my career. Let me try to get you know the best deal I can in the off season, uh, so I can set myself up for the future. Uh, Josh, I'm going to read a tweet here that you posted uh, a few days ago, and then I'll ask you to to elaborate on it here because it, it made me kind of chuckle to myself when I read it. It says Nelson Aguilar reached 20.95 miles per hour on his 40-yard touchdown versus the Giants, which is the 10th fastest speed a player reached in Week 16 per Next Gen stats. So, my question is. Why don't they try to do more with him downfield, number one? Or number two, you know, what Aguilar are we going to have here in Philadelphia beyond? Is it the guy who dropped the easy pass earlier in the game or the guy who got the 40-yard touchdown by, I don't know, turning on these jets that we didn't know he had? Yeah, well, I mean, just the first question, or the first part of the question about you know, why not target him more downfield, honestly, it's just because when they have tried to take shots from downfield, he doesn't get open. I mean, that play, that's why I think it's kind of interesting that 40-yard touchdown, uh, touchdown catch Nelson Aguilar had against the Giants, that wasn't even his best play of the game. I mean, I thought his his 9-yard or 7-yard catch just along the sideline, getting his knee down and bounce, I thought that was much more impressive because that 40-yarder, it was just a blown coverage by the Giants. The, the, uh, the backside cornerback just didn't carry with Aguilar, so that's why he was wide open. Um, as for the second part, you know, what kind of Nelson Aguilar – are we going to get in the future? Honestly, he's one of the most confusing guys on the roster to me because when you look at the tape, you see the improved route running. You see, um, you know, maybe he's not getting open down the field a lot, but, you know, you just see him, the routes are sharper, uh, the technique is better, and so that gives you optimism because even if you look at his worst plays of the season, I mean, that drop that he had in Seattle, I thought it was incredibly ironic because he ran a great route against one of the NFL's best cornerbacks and got wide open just because of his route running, his footwork on that play. And then obviously he drops it and negates all of that good work he put in. So you see the improvement with the route running, but then you see the hands is just so inconsistent. You've seen the drop that he had on that quick slant early in the game. But then, as I mentioned before, the, the seven-yard catch along the sideline, and you're like, well, if you can make that catch along the sideline, why are you dropping the slant in the first quarter? And it's just it's just confusing to me. I mean, there's no other way to put it. And you, you, know, you see some room for promise, but... I mean, until he catches the ball consistently, it doesn't matter if his route running improves. It doesn't matter if he gets open against top corners like Richard Sherman or Joe Hayden because if you're not going to capitalize and catch the ball, it's all for naught. Good points. Uh, let me ask you about running back. Obviously, no Ryan Matthews, no Wendell Smallwood, no Kenyon Barner. There is Darren Sproles and a couple of guys who've been around uh, for a couple weeks. Well, one in Byron Marshall, and then there's Watson, who it sounds like might get activated later this week. What can we expect from any kind of Eagles running game this week in terms of who do you see getting the most carries and do you see the other two guys being used? Yeah, I mean, well, Byron Marshall will, will definitely be used. And, I mean, he he might almost get – I mean, I think it has to be Darren Sproles who gets uh, the most carries just because it's not like – you know, Darren Sproles obviously, even though he typically plays around 50% or even more of the snaps, obviously used in more passing situations but Byron Marshall is also that type of running back where you really like to use his ability out of the backfield as a receiver you know get him to throw the ball to him dump it off let him try to make a play in space so it's not as if you have someone backing up Darren Sproles who's just you know got a guy that's going to pound it for you on the ground like a Ryan Matthews so you have these two running backs who are currently on the 53-man roster who are better as receiving running backs and then you have a guy on the practice squad who, you know, Watson, Doug Peterson seems to really want to you know, move him up to the 53, but ultimately that's not his call. It's going to be what, what Howie Roseman thinks is best because it's not just about this game, but, you know, maybe the Eagles find a cornerback, you know, that's available right now that they just want to get in the building and maybe get a preview of, okay, do we want to bring this guy in in the offseason or next year? So the implications aren't just, 
will they add a third running back, but maybe they'll bring in a cornerback who could compete for a spot next year. So uh, I expect Sproles to get the majority of the carries, uh, but you could see Watson moved up from the practice squad to the 53, depending on what Howie Rosen sees you know, from the other positions that are available. Josh Pawna with us, the Philadelphia Eagles beat reporter for Birds 24-7, phillybag.com. And Josh, this is our first chance to talk to you since Eagles, Giants, and more importantly, since Lane Johnson came back. And you were so impressed with Lane Johnson's impact that he got his own article, not just a blurb. He got a whole post was just on Lane Johnson. How did you quantify what impact Lane Johnson had coming back to the offense? Well, I mean, if you want to quantify it, just, you know, quantify it with seven points. I mean, that's, he was a, a huge part of that opening drive. Just the first play itself, shoving the defensive end upfield and then guiding uh, Ryan Matthews along the sideline, I believe it was, and helping steal off the inside for, what, 15, 17-yard gain, something like that. And then obviously, at the even a few plays after that, just in the middle of the drive, you saw him making nice blocks, good combination blocks with Brandon Brooks. That was obviously a question mark was, you know, we know Lane Johnson is talented, but the guy hasn't played football in more than two months. What's the communication and chemistry going to be like with Brandon Brooks, with whom he's only played four regular season games? Um, and so you had good combination blocks between those guys. And then on the 25-yard Darren Sproles touchdown run, you saw Lane Johnson lead the way, pull outside and steal Landon Collins. The Giants Pro Bowl safety steal him inside and help open up a really nice running lane for Darren Sproles, who obviously made a nice cut and made somebody miss to get into the end zone. So just the first drive alone was impressive from Lane Johnson. And one thing that, honestly, he was still playing well, especially in the running game. Uh, in the passing game, he had a, a couple of missteps in, in protection, but he was incredibly dominant in the run game, even late in the game, um, which surprised me because, again, he hasn't played in more than two months. Um, he, you know, he worked out for about five to ten weeks. He was out to try to rest his body. And, you know, it's one thing to work out, but it's another thing to be in football game day shape. And so I just I didn't think that Lane Johnson would be. But as some of his teammates mentioned, he, he's kind of a freak athletically. So uh, when you have that freak athleticism and that talent, you can still put together a nice performance after you miss ten weeks of football. And apparently he hasn't lost his quick wit. I guess he was asked today about getting a shotgun as a gift from Carson Wentz, and he said, I'm lucky I got anything at all. I may have gotten a shotgun to the face. Yeah, I actually I was just walking up. Um, <laughs> he said that right before the uh, uh, he kind of held court, and I was walking up just at the end of it, and all I heard at first was shotgun to the face, and I was like, oh, my God, this is how you know Lee Johnson's back in the Eagles locker room when you hear things like this but yeah he was uh just uh joking around before for answering our questions and and that's Lane Johnson for you he uh he's a guy that even you know in these circumstances he'll uh try to lighten up the mood and that's kind of the presence he has in the locker room is to try to lighten up the mood and get guys just uh you know just enjoying things a little bit more you know, uh, Josh, since so much of the Eagles happens uh, apparently off the field as well as on the field, I'd be curious to find out since this happened in the week uh, since we last talked to you, uh, just the whole friendship that's developed between Carson Wentz and Mike Trout, who's down our way, the Millville native, uh, and, and the fact that they went hunting together and you see pictures pop up on Instagram and, and, and just uh, and that little combo and that little pairing. Yeah, I mean, well, it, you think people like Carson Wentz now, but... You know, if Carson wants to try to the Phillies, I'm sure uh, fans would fans would like him even more. But uh, on a serious note, I mean, what Carson once described to us is that uh, Mike Trout's girlfriend, I believe, is was a Zach Ertz fan, and so you know, Zach Ertz and Mike Trout are friends or have become friends, and then they went hunting with Carson once, invited him along over this past week. And, uh, you know, we joked with Carson, well, if, if Mike Trout's an Eagles fan, you're the quarterback, he kind of has to like you, right? Carson's like, yeah, I, I guess so. <laughs> so uh, that's definitely been something that's uh, spread across social media pretty widely recently. Uh, Josh, when you look at the Eagles' defense, um, you know, it's easy to start looking ahead to the future now. I think everybody's kind of ready to put a stamp on this season and let it be done. But uh, where do you see – some of the biggest changes coming is it is it at cornerback where perhaps Leotis McKelvin and Nolan Carroll could be gone? Yeah, I mean cornerback is going to be absolutely one of the top priorities. 
my expectation is one of those two guys will be back between Leotis and Nolan. Uh, it would be real tough to find two new starters on the outside in the offseason. I mean, I, I think they need to both draft somebody potentially in the first round because that's one of the, the stronger position groups and looks like the Eagles can get a pretty good pick somewhere in the middle teens from the Vikings, uh, but also in free agency. Uh, still, though, I would probably expect, if I had to handicap it right now, I would guess that the Eagles uh, cut Leotis McKelvin, save about $3 million against the 2017 cap, and try to bring Nolan Carroll back, who's on a one-year deal, try to get him back maybe around that 2.5. $3 million range. It's kind of unclear what exactly the market for him will be like because obviously he's been healthier than last year when he broke his leg and missed several weeks. But, you know, this year he started off okay, um, had a stretch of playing pretty well, and then a bigger stretch of not playing very well. And then against the Giants, uh, he played a little better than he has recently. So he's been up and down. But if I had to project it now, I would say they bring back Nolan Carroll, uh, cut Leonis McKelvin, save a few million dollars and at least consider taking a cornerback in the first round of the draft. When you talk about the draft and you're, and you're um, you know, you talked about the first round pick they're going to have, which they weren't going to have until the Bradford trade, which now is looking like a pretty good first round pick. Um, what do you make of Howie Roseman's job that he did last offseason, how he's kind of put this team together now, and, and how important is this offseason going to be for Howie? to kind of finish building up some of this to be a playoff contender at least. Yeah, man, I definitely think this offseason is going to be a big one for Howie because um, he's made a lot of moves that, you know, the contracts, the Vinnie Curry contract, well, how's that working out for him? I mean, there are several other contracts, and obviously he had the fir his first tenure where, you know, before Chip kind of exiled him and pushed him to a side, which wasn't very impressive. Um, so, you know, he's not going to go anywhere this offseason. Obviously, he just got you a franchise quarterback eight months ago. But now the project begins of we got our franchise quarterback. We have to build around him. And, and that's why, again, you know, I mentioned how the Eagles, I could easily see them targeting a cornerback both in the draft high up and in free agency. Exact same thing with receiver. I could definitely see them getting a guy in free agency as well as targeting someone in the draft, maybe a second or third rounder if they want to go a corner in the first um, because the Colts have shown perfectly. You can have a franchise quarterback, but if you have an inept GM who doesn't build around him, doesn't have much talent on the roster, you're not going to go very far. So Callie Roseman did the hardest thing, which or one of the hardest things, which was get your franchise quarterback, but now you have to build around him and give people reason for optimism going forward. Josh Paul on with us, phillymag.com, birds 24-7. And, Josh, when I asked you about Lane Johnson a couple minutes ago, uh, the other uh, position that popped up in my head, because they're sort of de facto offensive linemen is tight end. Oftentimes the tight end uh, is supposed to be in and asked to block. Brent Selleck, you think, in that role. Zach Hurts, maybe not as strong a blocker. We remember what took place in Cincinnati. And then don't forget about Trey Burton. So I guess the question pops in my head, did the Eagles ever fully get that three tight end look they were looking for in your mind. Did they ever pull that off? And, and what's the state of the tight end position right now as you see it? Well, I mean, tight end is, is it has to be their strongest unit unless you want to uh, just project Carson Wentz down the road. Tight end's obviously the one of the strongest units with Ertz, Selleck, and Burton. Um, I think it took them a long time to get those three tight end sets to where they wanted them to, especially because you can't you know go 13 personnel with three tight ends if you're down two, three touchdowns. So just the nature of their games, you know, having that uh, the losing streak that they had, it's tough to pull that out very much when, you know, you're just going three wide receiver and, and trying to make up the difference. Uh, they, they have pulled it out, you know, here and there, um, especially in the, the closer games that they've won. Uh, I, I mean, some of their best runs, especially recently, have come out of those three tight end formations where uh, one of my favorite formations is where they line up all three tight ends on one side just next to each other with a couple of guys off the line, but still, you know, next to uh, the tight end that's in line. And so you see them run the ball well out of that set. Um, and then you, what Doug Peterson really would like to do is get the play action, those deep shots down the field, working off that three tight end set better because they've been able to establish to run some, uh, but you also have three guys that can catch the ball for you. I mean, Trey Burton is has to be one of the best you know, third tight ends in the NFL in terms of receiving. Uh, so you have that matchup, you know, him against 
really any linebacker who, or whomever you want to put him up against. So that's something that was a big storyline early in the year. Obviously got lost a little. Some guys got hurt. And the season didn't go how they wanted it to. Uh, but you've seen that three tight end personnel pick up more recently. And I think you'll see that carry over next year as well. Josh Bono from Birds247, phillymag.com. You can find him on Twitter at Josh Pauno, P-A-U-N-I-L. And you can also listen to him here on the Sports Bash on 97.3 ESPN as a guest. Josh, we thank you so much for your time and appreciate all the efforts, buddy. Thanks for having me, guys. Have a happy new year.